Madam Chair, we are live. Thank you, Julian. I call this meeting to an order. Uh, today is February 9th, 2021. Uh, this is the Public Safety Committee of the City Council. All committee members are present today via Zoom with Councilor Davis excused. This is a remote or online meeting where all participants will be on a video or audio conference. We are holding this meeting remotely so that everyone can participate safely while we are conducting business under a public health emergency. We appreciate your patience as public safety meetings are conducted this way. Members of the public were given the opportunity to address the committee with live comments, but I understand that there were none submitted today's, for today's meeting. However, written comments were received and distributed to the committee members in advance of this meeting. Members of the public, city staff, and the media have the ability to view this meeting live through YouTube and Zoom webinar. The live stream can be accessed from most smartphones, tablets, or computers. For those watching on the live stream, thank you for joining us. Before we move on to agenda item A, I believe uh, some of the counselors have some questions for our chief. And of course, uh, with the chief being uh, having a very busy schedule, I'm gonna have the counselors go first before our agenda items. Uh, Councilor Bassan, I believe you have your questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Excuse me, I have several questions that I submitted last week um, and I've discussed with the chief earlier, so I, I, this should go smoothly, but really it's, um, we were, we're just trying, I'm trying to update and keep tabs on discussions that were had at the end of last year. So um, there's there's many questions, uh, but let me know who or, or when I need to lay off. Um, so, the first question that I had asked um, is we had discussed and been told about an APD career development catalog and I've understood there's some changes that have gone underway, but I'm hoping that we can have um, a discussion and, and maybe be updated on what that development is because it was supposed to be completed by April 1st, 2021 and I don't think that's going to happen anymore, but I think there might be better news on the way. Madam Chair, uh, Councillor Bazan, this is uh, Interim Chief Medina. Yes, we've made some modifications. We looked at the original proposal and the original proposal asked that each unit create a specific curriculum for their unit and there was no uniformity or consistency across the city. Uh, we also know that in recent times we've seen that we've struggled uh, with investigations and we have identified that there were some issues. So one of the things that we started to do is we are creating what we call a detectives academy uh, it's going to be approximately uh, 80 hours long, and it's going to cover uh, teaching all of our investigators the key portions that they need to learn to be a basic level investigator. The career catalog will come in on top of that, and the career catalog will then have specific courses that are required that each specialized unit has to have specific for their area. Uh, as an example, for uh, our uh, auto theft unit, uh, they will have to get like a VIN uh, certification uh, on investigating VIN uh, cases. Uh, this class is going to be offered, like I said, for all investigators. Uh, what's, wasn't, uh, what wasn't tied together was the fact that we have investigators throughout the department and not just in CIB. Our background investigators conduct background investigations and at times we see gaps in those. Sometimes we see gaps in our investigations and we get questions on the traffic side as they're building cases for uh, to be prosecuted basically as like a vehicular homicide. So the core courses are gonna be covered in the invest and the detective course. And then on top of that, we're gonna, uh, we're identifying already which courses. Uh, we're on pace for the schedule we set. Uh, we had given a deadline of uh, February 14th for them to meet their first benchmark in this process. They've already met that first benchmark and. Uh, Commander Barker could give us an update if we want specifics, but we are set to go live with our first Detectives Academy in late June, early July. Our goal is to train all detectives that are in the department currently. Once they're all trained up on these topics, we'll start plugging in the specialized training for each unit. And from there, uh, we'll be able to start offering this to people who want to go into investigations. So they have this course prior to them uh, becoming investigators. So that's the modification we've made. 
uh, it helps us in being able to balance the DOJ needs also, because as we know, our academy is, is strained and the course catalog was just gonna offer courses every spring and fall. And there's no way without transferring large amounts of sworn officers to the academy that we would be able to accomplish that. So we're looking at this with a mixture of outside talent coming in and teaching us new ways and internal uh, training that they're coordinating with the DA's office. So to me, this also starts bringing in some outside influence into the processes that we're learning and teaching our people new ways that uh, maybe uh, we haven't been exposed to in the past. Thank you, Chief. Uh, and uh, Chief, Madam Chair, is there a time frame that maybe we can get uh, a more in-depth presentation to the Public Safety Committee regarding the new homicide, um, or I'm sorry, the Detective Academy? Yes, we'd love to give a presentation. We could actually put uh, PowerPoint together for council and, and go over it in whichever committee or whatever group would like to hear it and just have uh, Commander Barker's leading that and she could talk about the deadlines that were set, uh, what the benchmarks are for each one and what the curriculum is. And I could tell you right now that uh, we wanna bring in outside people and this is gonna be tied to your second question, uh, interviewing interrogations, interactions with crime victims and their families, constitutional law, testifying in court, search and arrest warrants, uh, the use of technology and making sure that we're able to tie in all the technology we brought to the department to help us with investigations are some of the places we want to bring in outside type training to expose us to new ideas. And then some of the courses from the department itself is felony case management, crime scene management, evidence collection, uh, some advanced report writing, and uh, basic uh, forensic uh, understandings uh, from the crime lab. So that, that kind of ties into one of the other questions and uh, that's what is gonna basically be the core and Commander Barker could give a good explanation on each one. Thank you, Chief. And and that was gonna be what, what Chief just said too um, for the committee is one of the next questions was um, that I had received an email stating APD was working on specialized training for homicide detectives uh, in particular. And uh, the question was going to be, what 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 has the department done to increase specialized and specific training, uh, which I think is going to tie into this presentation that I'm hoping if Commander Barker can let us know, not not now, but when is a good time, then if Madam Chair, we can add that to the calendar for a future meeting that would be, I think, beneficial for all of us. Um, so, Chief, what investigative or homicide specific training have the detectives received since September? And I ask this because I know January was a big month for homicides in Albuquerque. I don't think anybody here is, is, you know, that's a big secret. We all are aware. And so people are very concerned with the uptick. So I think that it's important to go back to say, what are we doing for our detectives and how are we enabling them and, and supporting them so that they can continue to hopefully reduce homicides in Albuquerque versus uh, letting it stay the same or increase. So again, what what has, have they received any specialized training since the last time we've spoken about this in September? Madam Chair, uh, Councillor Basson, uh, we have had some updated training. Uh, we worked with the DA's office uh, to kind of put a Band-Aid on some of the problems we were having. We have uh, some search and arrest warrant training that's been conducted in, in, in uh, cooperation with the DA's office, some uh, electronic tracking use of uh, being able to get information from computers, cell phones, social media. Uh, we've worked on some interview and interrogation type training. Uh, we've had some detectives go through a forensic experimental trauma interview uh, type training. We've had others attend an 80 hour uh, course on crime scene investigation. And a lot of the training that they've conducted is kind of a, a mixed bag of everything that we're gonna try to standardize in the Detectives Academy, but we wanted to make sure that we started exposing the current unit to these types of training uh, because we do currently have homicides that we have to investigate and we want to be as, as efficient as and as uh, successful as possible uh, with those investigations. Uh, we also, uh, not only is there training, there's also now a peer review. The new commander has brought the process and We've talked about this, about how we create a culture of self-improvement within APD and these peer reviews of how they're uh, working with each other to review cases, to see how they could uh, bring in influence from other parts of the department, I think is key. 
and uh, the, D, the DA's office is participating on those with us. Uh, you know, in terms of beefing up the unit, uh, we also, in, when I first returned, uh, when I became interim chief, we immediately assigned two additional detectives after the month of January, uh, we want to make sure that our detectives have time to work those cases. Uh, we did assign, we did give them two more positions, and we have uh, allotted for them to have some civilian assistance in terms of individuals who can help them organize and do the administrative duties uh, related to preparing cases so the officers could focus on the law enforcement parts. So we've made a lot of changes. Uh, we've given them more resources. If you think back to 2017, at the end, we had five homicide detectives who were happy when we grew it to 10, and now we're at 14 uh, detectives that should soon be assigned to the homicide unit uh, once they make uh, selections on these last two openings. Thank you, Chief. Um, and he just answered the next two questions. See how efficient? Um, okay, so Chief, uh, and then there's, uh, in the press conference on January 28th, the department, it was meant, you mentioned that the department is using technology to support excuse me, to solve crimes. What technology is APD referring to? What crimes have, what type of crimes have been solved or specific crimes that have been solved through this technology? And how many homicides have been solved using this technology that was mentioned? I think that uh, we have to recognize that we have had a lot of support from the current administration in increasing our technology. We've added shot spotter to the department, license plate readers, increase uh, video camera surveillance abilities. Uh, we've added a, a gun intelligence center. So those are some of the areas that we're looking at. And just to give some, uh, some stats, uh, uh, you know, the problem is we have more than a st thousand stolen guns a year. So being able to track those guns uh, is important. And that's where our gun intelligence center uh, comes through. We have actual cases where our shot spotter has enabled our dispatched officers to get there in time to apprehend a suspect who just recently had shot some individuals. And Commander Nerbetsky is the best one to give us specifics, but I believe uh, we've had, uh, technology has helped us, I believe, with four uh, homicide investigations uh, since last year. And I'll let Lenny go ahead and cover those. Sure, thank you, Chief. Uh, so uh, Shot Spotter has been a real help to uh, both our, our members in the field and our detectives. Um, it really does provide um, a very good uh, notification that gunfire has occurred somewhere in the city so that officers can respond very quickly. Their response time is, is, is very quick. They get there, it's, it gets dispatched as a priority one call and they, uh, they respond in a very short order. And again, like the chief was saying, we've had numerous instances where they'll come around the corner uh, to a gunshot activation and our suspect will be standing there with a gun in their hand kind of stunned. And that's happened on a number of occasions. Um, for cases like homicide, we've had at least four instances since we've gone live in July where um, the, the information provided by ShotSpotter has helped detectives to further their investigations. You know, the way it works is it, it'll place, uh, it'll tell you exactly where shots were fired and it'll give you the exact sequence. So you can imagine as a detective showing up on the scene, kind of knowing exactly where a gun was fired is, is extremely helpful. Um, but at least four instances of where that's occurred. And then I, I know that we've worked very closely with the, the detective's attorney's office. And uh, in at least one instance, we were using ShotSpotter for a case. Um, and their, their feedback was the, the ShotSpotter technology really helped make the case and that it would have been a much more, much more difficult case to prove without that technology. You know, and I think one of the biggest opportunities we have as a department now is how do we roll this out to ensure that all our officers understand the technology. We have made some internal changes, even how we process uh, homicide scenes. For example, uh, recently I spoke to the homicide commander and, and the RTCC and I asked them if we could preserve all evidence from video cameras near homicide scenes. We don't exactly know uh, which cars are gonna be involved at this point in time. So we're looking at different ways we could incorporate that technology so we could use that surveillance video down the road or even our license plate readers uh, being able to have a documented path of cars that went through there. So if a year from now we got a suspect vehicle, we could go back and we could review this. So there's a good opportunity for us here in, in making sure that our officers be able to are developing the skills and understand the technology and uh, we're working on a series of short videos from the Real-Time Crime Center to our officers 
to make sure that they're learning more and more about this technology and how to apply it to their everyday jobs. Thanks, Chief. Uh, and then it, going back just real quick with those new homicide detectives, you said that there's two that are coming on, two additional new ones now, and then I think two more soon. Are they getting specialized training? I guess I'm still not clear on what, what is being done now for the new detectives that are gonna be going into, particularly into the homicide unit. What they're doing right now is they're conducting like a, they're doing an on the job training with them, but they're coordinating also with the DA's office to catch them up on those key areas, such as search and arrest warrants, uh, interviewing techniques, those key core areas, uh, we're getting them the informal training through the DA's office now until we establish the, the Detectives Academy. And then at that point, everybody who's a detective will have to have that certification to go through. Uh, Counselor, does that answer your question? Yes, Chief, that helps. I, I'm just really, I'm stuck on the fact that I feel like they should be getting some really specialized training if they're gonna be going into such a specific uh, position, but um, I guess that's making me look forward even more to this academy and being able to make sure that that our men and women that are out there doing these very difficult jobs have all the tools accessible to them um, in advance rather than in retrospect. Thank you. Um, uh, so I'll, I'll keep going with that if it's all right, Madam Chair. <laughs> um, thank you. So um, the shot spotter I know has been really, really integral, I think, and we've been hearing more and more about it. And I think that's really, really amazing. And I can't wait to see it continue helping. Um, what data analysis has APD doing to analyze the homicide data, especially right now? Again, I'm, I'm kind of focused on that because of January, but you know, what are we doing to analyze the results? Like what are the results of, of the types of homicides or why, how they're happening, where they're happening and since they're they're rising is the data analysis that if it has been if there's some analysis that's occurring is that working madam chair counselor bazan yes it's working and i could tell you that we have a weekly homicide report and i'll let commander tafoya talk about it a little bit but that is the way that we identified earlier in january when we started to see the spike we quickly identified that that it was drug related because of the data and how we're processing it. That enabled us to also recognize that these incidents were occurring at hotels also. So when we tied those two things in, it gave us the ability to have the field start coordinating uh, heavy presence in the motel areas, but it also led to us starting operations over social media that we talked about last week uh, in a press conference. And what we noticed was we did see that you know, as strange as it sounds, some of our biggest victims were the actual drug dealers themselves who were now getting robbed uh, as they were utilizing social media to set up operations. So I'm going to let Commander Tafoya just really briefly give an update on what he includes in the weekly homicide uh, report to that we use internally. And uh, then from there, you could see how we could start seeing what the nexuses are to the crimes so we could devote resources to it as quickly as possible. Dennis? Yeah, thank you, Chief. So every week we get with, well, every day we get with uh, Commander Nabersky with the RTC, uh, and we capture several demographics, um, and then we share them with the area commanders who then shares them with, uh, with their folks and also with the VIP program. So uh, some of the categories that we capture are weapons used, uh, homicide by category, uh, meaning any nexuses that we can uh, establish, um, genders, uh, race of victim, age of victim, and then we also provide a, uh, a detailed map of where these homicides are occurring. And uh, we collaborate daily, weekly um, to identify trends and then we jump on um, uh, sharing that information with the area commander so that they can make their, their uh, tactical plans to address the, the problem areas identified in their area command. Madam Chair, Councilor Bassan, one of the things I also wanted to do was increase communication amongst the police department. And right now we have begin a new program where at 8.45 every morning, there's a conference call between all commanders Monday through Friday that talks about the crime the last 24 hours. 
I want to make sure that we're communicating exactly what's happening in the past 24 hours. We have a 24 hour report that's been generated that basically tells every commander what are the felony crimes in their area command for the past 24 hours. I've stressed to the deputy chiefs that they should periodically ask their commanders and I've asked them at times uh, to make sure that they're reading that and they know what their trends are so they could jump on these trends more quickly. After every homicide above that, there's a debrief now department wide with that area commander and criminal investigations to update them on everything. Uh, that way, if there's the possibility of a retaliatory shooting or specific gangs involved, that the commanders have that information right away so they could start planning where their field resources are going to spend some of their, their time or where they could plan some of their operations for the next few days or if there's any suspects they should be looking for. So I think another big key to the technology and the data that we're collecting is it's important that we're communicating it amongst all the entities within the department so that we uh, they could be sharing that information and uh, they could be working with one another to complement each other's uh, efforts uh, with trying to reduce uh, the shootings and the homicides. Thanks, Chief. And, and it's good to hear. I mean, it's very good to hear that there's a an answer that there is data analysis happening and that B, it is being communicated so that it can actually be implemented to to try to be effective, in my opinion. Um, so going, you had mentioned the whole uh, social media, and I know that I've seen the anti crime uh, operations uh, on Facebook and and some, I guess, maybe celebrations. I don't know if that's the right word. Um, but for the last quarter of 2020, how did APD's arrest numbers compare to the previous year at the same time? Madam Chair, uh, Councilor Bazan, we're still uh, looking to pull those numbers. We didn't have enough time and they, there's some issues as we know, uh, data is a problem that we have in terms of records of, of, of reports. But one thing I can tell you is the preliminary data that we're seeing uh, in terms of uh, major crimes that we're focused on auto burglary, auto theft, robbery, uh, aggravated batteries, homicides, for example, the last quarter of 20 compared to the last quarter of 19, these numbers aren't finalized, but as soon as they are, we could bring those numbers to this group and, and explain the specifics of them. Uh, we, the, the trend is looking like there's gonna be reduction in almost every single category, including homicides. I believe like the last quarter of uh, 19 compared to 20, there may have been a reduction overall of something like four or five homicides for that quarter. We'll verify those numbers. As you know, uh, we're a little hesitant to release numbers without them being vetted because of uh, the issues that caused us in the past. But once we have those numbers verified and and uh, and pretty solid, uh, which I'm hoping, I talked to Deputy Chief Grego, we're hoping in the next two weeks, uh, we're more than willing to come back uh, to council and, and uh, kind of explain the numbers if they haven't been read in the paper already by then. That would be great, Chief. Do you, and I completely respect wanting to double check all the numbers before before sharing. And do you think that these anti-crime posts are, are beneficial and helping? I think they're very beneficial because I think when you understand our system in Albuquerque and the uniqueness of it is officers are arresting people every day. Every day we arrest individuals, but our struggle is how do we keep them in the system? Uh, and the resources to help individuals when they are released from uh, and not held in detention pending trial. So by focusing on the anti-crime operations, we're focusing on a lot of uh, no bond hold warrants. So that means the judge is gonna keep them in jail for a longer period of time because there's already factors that this individual is displaying that they can't be released so our success has been, and I take this back to 2010, 11, when I was in property crimes, we had a simple philosophy. If somebody was in jail 10, 15 day uh, periods and got out and we know we're gonna pick them up again and they get picked up again and they're in jail another 30 days, each big block that they're out, if they did a burglary a day, that's 15 burglaries in 15 days. And when you start adding that by 15, 20 criminals, in large blocks over the year, you really start reducing. So that's the same philosophy you're looking. And if you look back at our crime stats in 2010 and 11 for property crimes, it was one of our most successful times and we had low, low rates, but we had that philosophy of keeping individuals in custody as long as possible 
and building those cases that way. We're doing the same thing now with these no bond hold warrants. We're hoping we're able to keep these individuals in custody a little bit longer and that that's gonna impact our crime rates. Okay. And do you think that that has any impact by like the social media posts that I see too? You know, the bait card program uh, is based off of the community criminals knowing that there's the possibility of a bait card being stolen and they getting arrested in it. And when we went through the bait car school in Fort Worth in 2010, and that program was brought to Albuquerque, the number one thing they stressed to me at the time is as, as the command staff in charge of auto theft, they said, you're going to have to make sure that you're working with your PIO to advertise this because it is a deterrence to the community. And we're using that same philosophy purposely with social media is we want people who are dealing drugs on social media to know we're out there because we're hoping that it's a deterrent and uh, that they're going to stop using it. And then this is something even the officers that there's always a battle with auto theft used to always get upset with me and uh, they'd be all like, chief, stop telling everybody that the bait cars are out because, uh, or at the time, lieutenant or commander, because then they don't steal our bait cars. I'm like, yes, that's what we want is we don't necessarily want a ton of arrest. We want people to stop their actions. So we're hoping that the more and more we advertise that we're arresting and looking into these situations, that it will deter people from using those, those uh, uh, avenues to commit their crimes. Awesome. I, I'm all for being proactive rather than always just reactive. Um, so uh, next question that I have is what partnerships or are there partnerships with other departments, uh, whether it be, you know, other law enforcement agencies, the, the sheriff, the state, the anybody, what partnerships is APD collaborating with and are they being um, beneficial and, and helping as far as kind of teaming up to reduce crime in Albuquerque? Councilor Senna, uh, I mean, uh, Madam Chair, uh, Councilor Bazan, I think it's imperative. And I think if there's no one thing that I think is the most important thing that I do as interim chief is create those partnerships. Uh, when I came back in 2017, we immediately created the partnership with State Police Auto Theft and OSI, which has assisted us in continuing to reduce auto theft. And when you look at our auto theft improvement to 17 till now, it's almost been cut in half. And I just got a report from, from uh, National uh, Insurance Bureau that, that says most cities saw 15% increase last year in auto theft. We still had a decrease and it could be a double digit decrease. It's gonna be close. It's that partnership that made that successful. So we have partnerships, strong partnerships with state police. We have strong partnership with Office of Superintendent of Insurance. Uh, the DEA just left my office uh, about 20 minutes ago, they're going to be helping us with a joint operation in the month to come. Uh, we meet regularly with some of our other federal partners. Uh, we've assigned uh, task force officers to a lot of federal entities so that uh, they could assist us in getting those cases into the federal systems like we like. And I think it goes beyond our law enforcement partnerships. I think it also goes to, uh, we have to have a strong relationship with the DA, our current uh, in uh, commanders uh, are building that strong relationship. Uh, the DA's office helped us with some of these social media operations. Uh, we're communicating more, uh, making sure that we straighten out those cases on the front end. And the last thing about partnerships I'll say is we know that our criminal justice system in Bernalillo County needs an overhaul. We know that more resources are needed at the DA's office, the courts, substance abuse, mental illness. If those four, if those four areas are key for us to get out of this this crime trend that we see, the police department can't do it alone with those four topics. The police chief has to be a great advocate for those four areas to get what they need. And I think uh, Jerry Batista is on this call, and, and she could talk about this later in terms of VIP and some of our intervention programs. But I'm a strong uh, believer in in have, giving them the resources they need to go out and make sure that they're able to uh, intervene in some of these shooting trends or retaliatory shootings or individuals going down a path. So I think that it's above law enforcement relationships. It's about relationships throughout the system 
uh, in the Bernalillo County area and how we can work with them. Uh, you know, both BCSO and state police do have officers assigned to our MATF task force, which investigates our shootings, which is also a benefit. So we have some level of, of uh, relationships with all the entities uh, and, and we try to work as much as we can with one another. Uh, and it goes beyond law enforcement, it goes to prosecution. And I've been meeting with a lot of community groups and a lot of different places where hopefully they could be advocates for us to help get the funding in those other key areas that I mentioned that are outside of our control. Okay, thanks, Chief. Um, and how many APD officers retired in 2019 and 2020? In 2019, 46 retirements. Uh, in 2020, 44, but we did have another uh, little less than 40 that separated from the city. We are currently at 957 office, 957 officers with 45 in the academy. So that would take us to a, right around a thousand. Uh, we are slated to have our biggest academy class ever this next spring with. Uh, we're close to having the 75 seated that we were hoping that should take us to 975 with the lateral class of 25 that should take us right around to the 1100 which we we uh, spoke about in September, but we know there's going to be some separations and retirements in this first six months so uh, as much as it pains me we may come in uh, 10 to 20 short of, of what we were hoping the 1100 and what we stated to Council but we're very close we're on pace. If you look at it, the first six months, uh, we netted, we grossed 45 total officers on this department. And in the spring, we're hoping to have basically doubled that uh, from the fall numbers. So we have a good recruiting uh, platform that we're using now. We're really pushing our background investigators. I actually gave them an additional attempt to help them. And as soon as we can, we'll probably give them uh, another uh, some more help in getting those backgrounds done uh, so we could increase the size of our academy classes and continue that pipeline. Uh, the relationship with CNM was very stressed at the end of last year. Uh, we've worked with them and uh, we will continue to utilize them to make sure that we have strong numbers uh, in their academy because we know that our academy can't sustain the load that's needed to keep up our numbers. I, I estimate that it'll take us about two more years of having to recruit anywhere from 150 to 175 officers a year. Once we get up to that 12, 1250 mark, then it'll just be maintenance. And if you figure about 40 to 50 retirements, I think at that point in time, uh, we'll be a little better off where we could uh, go back to, to uh, a lot of in-house training and uh, not such a stress on us having to devote so many resources to backgrounds uh, for hiring. Well, through no expertise other than sometimes my own bleak outlook, those numbers are sounding way better than I expected. So I'm hoping that we really do get close to the, you know, the goal of 1100. Uh, so that's, that's optimistic. Thank you. Uh, how many officers are assigned to the Field Services Bureau and are not a part of a specialized or unique unit like the PRT, bike unit, outreach, um, so their only job is to handle the calls and what so and patrol. You know, ops provided me these numbers this morning: 371 patrol officers, 53 patrol sergeants, 18 patrol lieutenants, six area commanders, uh, 21 bikes. As we know, bikes split their time between taking calls and being proactive, and 42 PRT, and they're kind of in the same situation as the bikes. They split between. Uh, being proactive and being out in the community taking calls. Uh, so that should equal, where's that number? 957. That should equal 511 in the field, more or less, when you add those up. Okay. Um, what percentage of property crimes reported to APD are solved and, and or cleared by arrest? I'm going to tell you that's probably under 10%. It historically always has been. Uh, those are some of the numbers that records is still looking to get for us for 2020. And as soon as those are available, I will get them out to you. Awesome. Thank you, Chief. Um, how many officers are expected to reach their high three this year? And I know in our earlier conversations, this is a very, um, very 
I guess, fluid in my terms because of the different years, whether it's three years or the five years, um, if I'm understanding all of it correctly, but how many officers are expected to reach their high three this year? Um, and then if you can just kind of go into what, what incentives are we offering or what kind of encouragement are we, are we trying to do to, in, in order to try to retain some of these very experienced officers who have been on the force for a very long time? You know, there are currently 121 officers eligible to retire. And that is basically officers with 20 to 25 years and nine months. And that's where things have changed very drastically for us since the para change that went from 80% at 22.9 to the 25.9 basically and 90%. So in the past, we always only had to worry about officers between 20 to 22.9 before, you know, uh, some stayed beyond that, but very few did. So now we have a larger period of time when somebody's actually eligible for retirement. So that kind of brings some obstacles for us. Well, right now I can say we have 43 officers that have been rehired and they're working on a new high three, but some of those may get their high three, but they're not at the 90%. So some of them are indicating they're gonna stay, some are indicating they're going to leave. So I think that's why it's important that we recognize we have to aim for about anywhere maybe 150, 160 to 175 officers that we're onboarding every year to keep up with those retirements so we continue the growth the way we want. Some of the stuff that we're doing is, of course, we know that through the CBA at 20 years, you have the biggest portion of longevity pay that we're offering our officers and you're considered a master patrol officer. Uh, so you have the highest hourly rate plus the highest longevity. Uh, we're in negotiations now and every time that we negotiate a CBA, that's something we always take into account is how we're going to get individuals to try to stay till the 25-9. So those are things that, that we always take into consideration. Uh, right now we've, uh, to help bring more officers on, uh, we brought back the lateral hiring bonus, which had been suspended, and we're giving a, a hiring bonus for laterals along with our regular cadets coming. Uh, we also have a tu uh, tuition reimbursement and a student loan forgiveness program for the next three years to try to attract individuals to stay. And uh, we're working on some other incentives for specialized units that, that uh, we're having trouble recruiting on. So there's a variety of different ways in which we're trying to retain individuals, but I think the key one is tied into the CBA and that uh, longevity pay that is given. We prefer to have the longevity because it lowers the hourly rate, which in turn saves us money when we pay overtime. So you know, it's only a couple dollars, but when you look at $400 in longevity, as opposed to, uh, to uh, an, an additional $5 an hour, that's seven fifty an hour we're saving for each hour of overtime, giving longevity rather than hourly pay. And I think I might have said five hundred on longevity, and I actually think it's four hundred. But we'll double check, and Cecily will get that over to you. Okay. Uh, you know, Chief, thank you for indulging me and just helping me keep, kind of keep tabs and follow up with um, with our conversations that we had towards the end of last year. And I'm sure I'll be back in another couple of months to follow up again. But I do look forward to the the Detective Academy. Uh, presentation in particular and and just kind of being kept apprised. So thank you for doing that. And thank you, Madam Chair, for indulging me with all of those, the allotment of time for questions. Madam Chair, Councilor Bazan, the last thing you know that I'd like to follow up on is uh, we are still working to improve the monthly report that I've been providing the council. And me and uh, Commander Barker talked about it yesterday. So we're still looking to see what we could add and find that balance so we could try to proactively give more questions. So some of the questions that you presented to us are actually we're going to try to reformat it so we could give council more information up front. And as usual, if anybody ever has any questions, my phone's always on 24-7 uh, and I try to keep everybody updated with little things that are occurring in the community when it affects them. So I just want to thank you, council for their support and we'll continue to be as transparent and open as possible and answer the questions and continue the department moving forward in the direction that we all need it because this is basic, this is our community. So I think it's imperative we all work together. Thank you. Uh, 
Thank you for that, uh, Chief Medina. And before you leave, because I know you have something at 345, I did want to allow the opportunity for other members of this committee to also pose their questions. Councilor Benton, did you have a question for the Chief? I did. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, yeah, Chief, quickly, you said how many uh, bike certified officers are there? I guess you were, you were saying how many are on the street, but how many bike certified officers do we have? Madam Chair, Councilor Benton, I will get that information for okay. you, but how many certified bike officers we are, and, and Commander Mark will email you that information. Give us a few days. I don't have that on the top of my head. Okay, thanks. And and then how many, I, I missed it when uh, you were speaking to, to uh, Councilor Bassan, but how many, uh, you know, on a daily basis, you, you, you mentioned bike officers? Uh, 20, I think the number was 21. Let me double check. There's currently 21. 21 uh, bike officers in the city. Okay. And then just a quick one, and, and you know, we'll let you go, uh, hopefully. Uh, but the um, complaint I often get from constituents is they'll see this has to do with the homeless population or the street population, uh, and that they'll see one individual, and we've got four or more, you know, uniformed officers, sworn officers, dealing with one kind of, you know, whether they're down and out or whether they've been screaming in an alley or whatever it might be, that, there, that there's been a question from my constituents about the number of officers they see in those kind of situations. And I think everyone, the, the, the general public, the council, all support the idea that, that APD is the wrong people to be there dealing with that person, most likely. Um, but but nonetheless, they're there. They do need services in the absence of what we're trying to build as a more robust system uh, of uh, homeless services. That uh, why so many, and and you know, is there an explanation for that? You don't have to necessarily answer now. I think that's something, though, I just wanted to put out there because it's something I repeatedly hear from constituents. Madam Chair, Councillor Benton, I, think I do have a response to that. And it's very situational. There are some situations where our policy requires us to dispatch two officers and a supervisor because of the, the fact that the individual, if they're armed or potentially armed and violent, and then we have to have under uh, our settlement agreement, we have what we call a layered response where we have officers who are, one's gonna communicate, one's gonna be less lethal, and one's gonna be a lethal option. So that's sometimes why, but it's not the case in every situation. And sometimes we do get too many officers. And this is just the conversation I had with uh, the deputy chief of the field is, how do we start getting just what we need there? Because for me, it's, if we're reviewing video on every single use of force of every officer on the scene, let's just get what we need there. So we're not reviewing any extra video we need. So it is something we're looking at. Uh, there is no uh, magic solution to it, but I think it's it's working ensuring that supervisors are managing their scenes and they're making sure they're pushing officers into service when they should be and when they shouldn't. If in an ideal world, if I had enough resources, I would love to have a lieutenant permanently assigned to disc radio to sit there and catch those things and call people out and say, you have too many officers, clear some. But we don't have those extra resources at this point, but a long-term goal is some type of oversight system and dispatch that's watching over all commands and catching these situations and making sure the appropriate number of people are there and that we're not over dispatching because we know it hurts all the other calls holding. So hopefully someday we'll be able to have a program like that, but we just don't have the resources right now. Understood, uh, Chief, and uh, thanks. It, it uh, you know, it's all just about trying to get the most we can out of, I mean, we've got great officers, we need to, to utilize them to the best extent. And, and I think that's what people see. And, you know, some people may interpret that, oh, they're ganging up on that poor person, but, but others are really just saying, uh, why so many, you know, shouldn't they, they be doing something else? <laughs> and which, which again, we're granted that they should be. 
and I think uh, most likely, you know, a lot of folks who are on the street, uh, if I'm out there on the street, I would probably have a pretty big knife if I lived out there. And I know that, that that's a concern and the safety of the officers are a concern, obviously. But, uh, but um, yeah, I just wanted to, to get that. I appreciate your perspective, Chief. I appreciate also that, that you really are uh, leading a, a more thoughtful uh, APD, you know, just in the way we're approaching things. And, and I appreciate that you're very methodical about it and you really believe in fighting crime. So thanks for that. Uh, and thanks for all the officers. So anyway. Thank you, Councilor. Uh, thank you for that, Chief. And I know you do have to get going, um, but I know I, I wanted to uh, do this just before the council meeting and before we get onto the agenda items is also just uh, sharing a moment of silence for our state police officer that was killed in action as well. So um, if we could just take a moment of silence and just um, thinking about him and his family. Thank you, um, everyone, for, for taking that moment of silence um, and just recognizing um, what our officers do um, on a daily basis and what they are doing and committed to doing and keeping our, our community safe. So I appreciate that. Um, and thank you all for your uh, patience as we move on to the agenda item uh, A, the presentation from the Albuquerque Police Department's Rapid Accountability Diversion Program. I believe Ms. Covington has a presentation. Ms. Covington, I, you should have the floor here. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the, of the committee. Uh, RAD, which is the Rapid Accountability Diversion Program um, under the police, uh, the police department is a pre-arrest diversion program. So next slide. And um, this is, um, like I said, a pre-arrest diversion program to deal primarily, we're starting off with youth misdemeanors. Um, and by diverting these youth to a program based in restorative justice, Albuquerque joins dozens of cities around the country who have proven that restorative justice reduces recidivism sets youth on a better path and keeps officers out of court while holding youth accountable. And so the um, officers pre-arrest referral process, um, the officers of course are the, the first line of defense. So the RAD program takes uh, referrals from officers for youth involved in underage drinking, shoplifting, street racing, and minor petty property crime. And the program initially started off with just serving youth under 18, but we've now um, expanded it to serve youth up to the age of 20. And officers inform the youth that they can elect to attend a four week diversion program in lieu of the possibility of going to court. If the youth agrees, then the officer emails the information to me and I contact the youth and get them in the next available class. And uh, the, what we have down there um, is a video made by um, police officer talking about restorative justice program. So maybe if we have time, we can look at that in a little while. Next slide. So the restorative justice class, 
During the class, youth get to reflect on their deeds and discuss how their de deeds affect the community. They're also taught anger management, coping, de-escalation, and communication skills. These skills provide the youth with alternative ways of dealing with problems that led to their behavior. So the community, the best is the, the most important part of restorative justice best practice is dealing, is dealing with these programs in the community. So best practices state that restorative justice succeeds most when it's community-based. To that end, 18 community members have been trained as circle keepers and community participants. They've already participated um, in some of the RAD classes. And um, it was a, a great success. During the class evaluation, youth stated that they appreciated being listened to rather than lectured at, and that hearing people share how they overcome similar problems um, was helpful. And so we will be tracking recidivism um, within a year of taking the class so that we make sure um, that these kids aren't coming back and sort of circling through, um, you know, the, the system. And this was um, uh, something that happened this Saturday. We've got a number of people um, in the community um, and um, some people from uh, the justice system who are very interested in knowing about restorative justice. So this Saturday, um, we had, uh, we showed a, a film that was made in California called Healing Justice. And um, it talked about what restorative justice was and how it's used and how it's beneficial. And we're hoping to um, do something like this um, once a month so that people who wanna know um, can learn. And as a result of that, we had several people who um, have asked if they can, can get involved um, because they really like what they saw. Um, the program has been um, really su successful. Um, we've had a couple of, a couple of classes. Um, numbers are down, of course, because of, because of COVID, there's not quite as many um, calls to the police. But when there are, um, we get at the last class that we had, um, there were eight referrals and six kids elected um, to take the class. Cause again, it is voluntary. Um, and it was, it was really great. Um, we had um, some people come in, um, Angel Garcia, who's um, part of the violence intervention program um, as well as um, a young man um, named Aaron Rogers, who um, is one of those people who was able to talk to them as a peer um, about being in their situation um, years before and not a lot of years before and what happened to him and how he was able to turn it around. And when we talk to, to the kids, because we do sort of an evaluation part um, at the end of the class, that was one of the things that they brought up most was that they really appreciated hearing from people that they see from as peers and hearing how other people, you know, just like them um, who had had run-ins with the police were able to turn their, li their lives around. And they were very appreciative of, of that, which I thought was, was great. That seems to make uh, the most difference when people are able to share their stories, then it becomes real um, to the youth. Any questions? In the future, um, we are hoping, hopefully if we all survive COVID, that we'll be able to do more RAD programs to serve the community, um, including working with adults. Any questions about this? Counselors, any questions? 
Thank you, Ms. Covington. I did actually have a few questions, but uh, I think I'll, I'll just follow up with you on that, especially around restorative justice. I uh, sought to enter a restorative justice practice myself um, on, a, on a personal matter. Um, it didn't pan out um, as I had hoped, but just being in that and being a part of it, um, I just respect you and the program so much in our attempt to um, really intervene in some of these situations and really have a community effort in it, it because I do believe that it is so important. You touched on it briefly that uh, you're hoping to extend this to uh, an adult community as well. Yes, um, one of the things that we've seen in other cities is that when they use um, restorative justice with adult offenders, that it also um, works really well in lowering the recidivism. Um, and even um, there are some programs right now in California where they're even going into the prisons and doing restorative justice before people are allowed um, to, to uh, before their, their date of getting out. And they also have data that shows that even that helps them to re-enter the community better because they have to meet with, with community people. Um, and so again, having that set up before they even get back on the streets really has lowered recidivism. Um, and so my next question too is, do you partner up with APS for a lot of our students there or if they enter into this program? That's one of the things that we're hoping right now. Um, we're only taking referrals from the officers that are on the streets, but there has been um, a lot of interest from some teachers in APS. And so I'm trying to figure out a way that we can do that. Um, start off by training teachers and then training students, because that's another thing that we find that there's far less um, youth that get in trouble when they know an alternative way of solving disputes. So that's my, my biggest hope is that we um, can really do this um, in a way that it becomes a mindset for people. So that instead of thinking, uh, you know, they've got a, a beef with somebody and they immediately think of violence, they instead think that there's another way they can handle it. Yeah. Madam Chair, um, if I could address that as well, um, Jerry Paticha with the VIP program. Um, the, um, there are um, existing restorative justice programs that serve some of the school referrals already for the juvenile justice system as diversion programs. So um, we definitely will align with that, but for like uh, offenses like public affray, misdemeanor offenses, um, there are some restorative justice things happening around that. Um, embedded in the juvenile justice system. And, and Tanya used to be part of that as well. So, but we can definitely pick up more on our end. Uh, thank you for that, Ms. Tichicha and Ms. Covington as well. Uh, I'm glad that there is this connection and um, I'm a big supporter of restorative justice and I'm really thankful that this program exists. I would love to have further conversations with you as we're trying to address um, our racing and speeding within Albuquerque is just all across the board um, in every part of town. And Councilor Bassan and Councilor Bennon are also part of this working group that we have. So we're really trying to address it and get the heart at the heart of the issue. Um, so we'd love to just uh, touch base with you at some point and, and hear about what your experience is with a lot of these um, street racing uh, youth, um, because I believe that we could intervene in that area a little bit better. Great, thank you. I would love to, I look forward to it. All right. And you have my uh, address there, so time. Yeah, well, thank you so much, Ms. Covington, and also to you, Ms. Baticha, as well. Um, both programs are, are pretty critical and essential in, in doing these interventions for our youth. Um, as Councilor Brisson was just talking to our chief as to how we can do things a little bit better um, in, 
in addressing our crime. So thank you both so much. I'm gonna move on to the next agenda items if other counselors don't have any further questions. All right, well, thank you again uh, to the both of you, Ms. Covington and to Ms. Baticha. We'll move on to agenda item B um, and I'll move this for Councillor Pena, um, R133, uh, commissioning an update to the 2014 social services gap analysis study and adjusting fiscal year 2021 general fund appropriations to provide funding for that purpose. I'm gonna move that without recommendation so that it goes to full council. And I believe that there's gonna be amendment. I don't know if Councillor Pena is on here anymore. Do I have a second? <laughs> I'll second it, but I can't find my hand again. For some reason as a panelist, there's there hasn't been a hand today. Oh, you're right. I don't see that either. Thank you, Councilor Bassan, for that second. Um, do we have any questions from Council or anyone from administration to, to talk about this? Uh, Madam Chair, this is Isaac Padilla. We did, um, we've had some conversations. What this comes from is from um, the ABCGC, and they want to kind of complete a gap analysis on some of the services that we need. Um, we've been talking to Councillor Pena, who's a sponsor of this. Um, she would like to move this forward without recommendation now and see if we need to have an amendment moving forward. But we're in conversations with the county right now, um, and we should have some additional information by the council meeting where it will be heard if it passes this committee on the 15th of March. Okay, thank you for that, Mr. Padilla. That was from my understanding is that there is uh, a plan for a few amendments to address some of the issues. And I appreciate um, everyone who jumped on this call to kind of talk about it. Uh, but I am gonna, I think the, the motion on the floor is to move this without recommendation. So that does go to council. So we can kind of have that further discussion. Councilors, any other questions or comments? Madam Chair, I think Councilor Pena has gotten back on to the call. Oh. Councilor Pena or oh, Councilor Benton. You're muted. Sorry, I wanted to ask a question about uh, that's in the staff write up about the time frame uh, on this. If if Councillor Pena is, I see Clarissa there, but I don't can't see whether she's really here. Yes, I, I'm here. Oh, yeah. Sorry, right. <laughs> I've been listening <laughs> to the entire meeting on my cell phone, and then I tried to click on in my computer, and it just wasn't happening. So, thank you, Madam Chair, um, Councillor Betton. Uh, actually, I think uh, Isaac kind of clarified. So, in the interim, when we put this forward after the last ABCGC meeting, um, we discussed kind of working off the original framework. Since then, um, Margarita and Director Pierce have talked about, you know, there's been some other analysis done. So they wanna make sure that we're including everything, that the, frame, the total framework that we're doing now, and then um, enhance upon that and identify any gaps from there. Because at um, the ABCGC meeting, I mentioned that I really didn't wanna start all over but I think that we should look at what we're working on and make sure that um, whatever uh, gaps still persist that we need to, to address those rather than reinventing the wheel. So um, if you pass without a recommendation to council, probably put, be putting in some amendments. If it's substantial enough, it'll be a floor sub, but it'll be with the information provided by both Director Pierce and Margarita from the county. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, uh, Councillor Pena. I, I, I do think you know this is the kind of thing that that should be updated regularly, and we should do you know out of the uh, continuous process of trying to maintain the best information possible to to help make decisions. So, thanks for that and uh, better understanding of of where we need to go. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. And thank you also to Councillor Pena for jumping into this committee. 
Um, any other questions or comments before we move on to the roll call for vote? All right, thank you, Ms. Hinojos. Can you pull the roll? Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Benton. Yes. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor Senna. Yes. That passes on a 4-0 vote. All right, thank you all. There being no further business, the Public Safety Committee meeting is adjourned.